You may all remember me from the archaic guy that got introduced <laughs> earlier at the start of the sessions. Um, <laughs> and um, turnabout is fair play. So I'm at the microphone now because I want to do that turnabout. Uh, but before I do, um, as the relic from the downtown board, I want to say and emphasize the, the important role and the dedicated role that all the people on that board serve. But more importantly, um, the, the role that the staff, uh, the, the uh, designation coordinators, and the people that support them, um, it's amazing what they do. And even though I've had the privilege of being around for a long time, it still astonishes me what they accomplish uh, and the directions that they lead us in. And so uh, I, I'd like to ask us all to give them another show of appreciation. But then there's the guy that embarrassed me. Um, I guess I, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of uh, board chairs. Uh, and I think we all find ourselves in this situation once in a while uh, when there is a change, a, a new board uh, chair comes on board. And I remember saying to myself, who's this guy? And that's, that's sort of an honest appraisal of whenever there's a new guy. It didn't take long for Josh Hanford to stop being the new guy and become the guy. Uh, and, and I think we all owe him an incredible um, thank you and a wish of good luck uh, on what he's moving on to because he's left us in a good place. He's left us with a mission. And we are all here today, I would dare say, embarking on his mission and that mission that is being laid out before us. So please join me in saying good luck and thank you to Josh. Good afternoon. Oh, come on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, good. It's too soon for the, you know, the post-lunch coma thing that happens and all that. Um, uh, let me ask, did, did you enjoy your lunch? Yeah. I did too. I've been asked on behalf of the consultant team to especially say thanks to Amy and to Alice and to everybody on the DACP team that made it possible for us to have this space and set everything up, and particularly for feeding us all. Please join me in thank you. So my name is Kristen Herman. If you remember way back in the morning when you just only just had your coffee, you may have seen my picture in a little circle up there. I'm the emeritus member of the Smart Growth for America team. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about some approaches that other states have tried in the areas that we're talking about today. Now, I have to start off right from the beginning by saying that you know, we, we do this kind of work around the country and whatever we're, the topic is, we're frequently talking to folks about and we're asked to bring examples and what are best practices. And you know, we'll talk about what are the sort of top five, you know, exemplary programs, the places that you know, have the best practices, that if you do this, they, they're really getting it right. Um, in this case, this is a little more challenging because the truth of the matter is there's not a lot of competition in this space. That uh, the states around the country 
lots of them just aren't doing any of this at all. So there aren't very many exemplary programs. I'm not sure there is an exemplary program. There are some examples of a few places besides Vermont that have tried to do something with this, and some of them have tried some interesting things. Um, but you know, the, the first point is that, to a large extent, Vermont's already a leader and been a leader in this area. So that's where we were starting from. Um, nonetheless, there may be features from some other states that are worth thinking about. Now, it's always the case that you know every place is different, unique, and you can't just take what somebody else did and they won't work here, that kind of thing. But there may be features of particular states' approaches that are worth thinking about. Even for some that don't, where it's obvious, you can't do this kind of thing in Vermont, it wouldn't work. It still may be worth thinking about what it tells you about um, the approach that another place has taken. Now, I will say that you know this, uh, the, the case studies we've done are going to be part of a report, which will be in more detail, which will be able to see later, and you know, will inform the whole thing. Uh, here, I'm just going to be sort of cursorily running through uh, a few examples, but you know, hopefully, this will help to stimulate the conversation you're going to have after I stop talking and you go back to tables. And that's kind of really what this is all about, is to give you kind of some, some food for thought. Um, there are some qualities of uh, you know, different states' approaches to think about that may you know, be part of what you want to think about in yours, like you know, how clear goals are, uh, how, how what you're doing fits into an overall state approach, how the leadership is structured, and uh, what kind of support you get, how different agencies across are or not aligned, and various things like this. And, and these are, again, just you know, some of the things to think about. How hard is it to do? Uh, because other states have you know, found kind of different uh, responses to these things. We're going to look at uh, very briefly at five different states that, that have tried to do something along these lines and, and may have something uh, to contribute. So uh, the first one is Maryland. And in Maryland, in many ways, does stand out because it's one of the only examples of there really being a statewide effort, um, you know, to, which to some degree, Vermont had starting over that 250, for instance. There aren't very many examples of that kind of thing. Maryland is an example of a statewide initiative, uh, in that case, very much led by a governor, to create a, an over, overarching statewide priority and a system for implementing it. And in many ways, that's where the term smart growth it got popularized. Um, so uh, just to talk kind of briefly about what they do, uh, there are kind of three designation programs. And as you can see, this, this came about in the 90s, so it's been around you know, for a while, um, particularly with the, the first two parts is the priority funding areas, which is the way in which resources get through to communities. There's a, also a rural aspect to the program. And in 2010, a new component of uh, sustainable communities focused on, on redevelopment of old, older communities. Um, the you know, key one here with the priority funding areas uh, is that you know, it directs resources to legacy communities, basically. Um, it in, includes infrastructure requirements um, and it basically tries to say, we're going to put re infrastructure in the places, but not in the places that aren't the designated places. Uh, and that's you know goes beyond what a lot of places will do. They'll put money into folks, but they won't take the step of saying, and we're not going to fund the places we don't want development to go. Uh, so it's really intended to just, to not only encourage growth in the priority funding area, but to discourage growth outside those areas. Uh, the newer program is, um, as I said, kind of focused on redevelopment issues. Um, it's it, 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 they are all PDAs, but they're a subset of PDAs basically. Um, it uh, provides funds for demolition and supports anchor institution development within the, within the PDA. So uh, the, the, some of the key things to, to think about in, in what this involved was that it really was a gubernatorial level initiative. And it left with uh, a structure from the top of state government down that remained in place. So there's a sub-cabinet, uh, the governor's sub-cabinet on smart growth. And with authority for the person who's in charge of that to make sure other departments are acting in alignment with it. Uh, and uh, that is, again, goes beyond what most anybody else has done. Um, part of the significance of this, though, I would say, is that uh, after you know, three decades, 
this is still going. And there have been different governors, and there have been party changes, but even governors of the party, not of the one who started this, have not brushed it aside, but have you know, sort of at least nominally owned it. And the degree to which it's successful, and everybody's doing the things, plenty to argue about, but the point is it's had staying power. I think part of that is because at the highest level, it was established as a statewide priority in a way that was, uh, that was likely to stick harder to, to brush aside. Uh, so, you know, it does have real dollars behind it. Uh, you know, it's again, I think a place-based designation system, and you, there's a comprehensive set of resources that can support communities within those uh, designated areas. Uh, it includes, you know, money, uh, as well as tax credits. Um, it's coordinated, targeted, uh, and it has a local business component as well under the new, uh, the newer part of the program. Uh, Maine is, uh, perhaps some of you may know since it's nearby, um, that my understanding is that they're right now looking at a significant uh, reform proposal of their own, so uh, this may be changing, but um, there are two major programs in this, a downtown revitalization program and a growth management program that has priority development areas, uh, particularly targeting housing, which I think is you know, one of the things we've heard about in talking to people uh, that people are interested here. Um, Part of what's interesting is the way they did it, and kind of a little bit like what I think this, this process indicates, you know, trying to map uh, the existing policies to what, what our outcomes uh, tended to be. Uh, the biggest thing I'd say about Maine that's kind of interesting to contrast with uh, the Vermont approach uh, up to this point is that instead of having designated uh, you know, designated programs, uh, sorry, designated areas, designated programs with their own channel of funding. Uh, they essentially have your priority development area, you know, you're designated, and now we figure out what kind of funds are appropriate and they can all apply. So it's um, a little more pooled and, and channeled in that sense. Um, and they have some requirements like a resilience plan, again. So they are somewhat targeting housing and resilience issues, and again, that may be relevant uh, to your consideration. Utah had a history that it was not unlike uh, what happened with Maryland, where there was a statewide initiative. And um, it, it was very broad. And in fact, that's one of the things that was uh, most distinctive, I think, about Utah for a long time, that uh, although it had gubernatorial support, it wasn't strictly speaking just a governor's initiative. It was um, an effort that brought together community leaders, business leaders, major institutional folks uh, in something that's called Envision Utah, uh, again, back in the late 90s. And um, they got a very strong, again, statewide commitment that resulted in a number of different programs and a number of different ways they went about this. Uh, you know, they use a Main Street program. Lots of places have Main Street programs, but they used in different ways. Utah's um, was very much a, a function of this. Um, a fund was created, the McAllister Fund, that uh, specifically you know, provides resources. They had uh, a, a set of standards for quality growth uh, communities. Uh, I guess I should say that it's not clear that the Utah program today is what it was when for it started and for quite some time. And that is an illustration of the fact that if you don't have continuing political commitment, none of this may matter very much. And so that's part of the trick, is how do you ensure that you've got something that is gonna have deep enough roots that uh, you, know, you don't just have lack of interest and, and a lack of follow through later on. Um, but I do think that the Utah model has a lot of uh, good elements. Uh, again, one of the things it had is that very much integrated throughout uh, state policy and um, the, the ability to get alignment of goals and resources uh, devoted. Now, you know, they're, they're among the issues are funding, and that comes up with a lot of these. If you don't have money behind it, it's harder to make these things happen. And so, you know, I mentioned the, 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 the McAllister Fund, which is basically going about it by trying to preserve agricultural land and kind of the reverse way of getting compact development by not having the agricultural land disappear, which uh, I think, you know, is a viable strategy. But it, it, success depends a lot on being able to fund that, and they've been up and down on this. So uh, I think for Next year, the current fiscal year, they have $3 million in it. In 2018, they only had $800,000 in it. 
And that's the kind of thing the commitment can go up and down. Um, but real money is one way you can get things done. Delaware, I think, is of interest in part because there's some parallels with Vermont and some real differences. Uh, you know, it's sort of a similar size state. Uh, it's also, you know, heavily rural, uh, has a big you know, tourism component to its uh, economy. Um, it's also very different in just kind of the institutional uh, culture, the political history and all. Uh, so it, if you had a spectrum of kind of state integration to real local control, uh, Delaware is pretty high on the, the state end of the spectrum, probably more so than people in New England would be comfortable with. Um, I haven't spent much of my youth in New England. Um, but I think it does illustrate some of the benefits of this because uh, the Delaware system overall involves a fair amount of integration from the local level, which is basically county. And there are three, so it's fairly simple in a small place. Uh, but there is a state agency, uh, you know, a cabinet level committee that has a role, and there is an office of state planning coordination, and that is you know, a significant difference from what most states would ever do. Um, but it does mean you can get more consistency across the state and across state agencies. And so um, I think that's something to think about as you, uh, as you think about what you want to try to aim for here and what things you can or can't do here. Uh, they do get just, you know, uh, I think a more coordinated effort than, than most places are, are able to do. They have, again, designated districts and uh, you know, funding that uh, is based a lot on, on those. Michigan is a very different situation. Obviously, it's a large state. Um, it has a, uh, a history in its programs that is not, uh, as compared with, particularly compared with Maryland or Utah or Vermont, they have never had a big statewide commitment overall to bring this in. The, the, the Michigan programs are fundamentally about economic development. So their place-based designation type, all these programs are really about you know, revitalization, workforce development, a range of things like that, without talking a lot about the, uh, kind of the bigger goals that, that you have here. Uh, on the other hand, it does serve a lot of those goals. Um, and I think you, know, you can understand how politics may result in this sort of thing in different places. Uh, but the key thing is having done that, they do a lot to coordinate those efforts and to uh, support them with funding. It's basically run by one agency, and it's uh, the Michigan Economic Development uh, Commission. Is, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a significant player, and it has a lot of tools, so that if a community is getting help through this, there's a you know, good coordination and a number of different kinds of resources that can be brought to bear. Um, and you know, direct funding, tax incentives, things like that, um, which, which makes this, uh, an interesting thing to look at because of, again, even though it's in a sense more narrowly focused, it's uh, more intense and uh, in, involves a pretty significant level of commitment on the, on the part of the state. Uh, they do things to help people understand. There's a developer toolkit, for instance. Um, so they communicate about what this does and who can apply for things and so on. Um, they do sliding scale for matching requirements based on population to make it easier for smaller communities to participate. Um, they can look at re uh, regional effects and um, they offer a lot of technical assistance. And that's another thing that we see in a number of programs, uh, sort of variation in the amount of assistance that they give, particularly to smaller communities uh, in being able to, uh, to deal with these programs. Um, and as I said, it's, it's more of a uh, development tool. It does distinguish between traditional downtowns and geographically disadvantaged areas. It prioritizes ge geographically disadvantaged areas for funding. Um, and again, as I said to start, it's, it's kind of a jobs and workforce development focus, uh, even though in the end it does a lot of similar things. Now, overall, I, I just note a few things about what we see in different places. A number of these, as I said, have a strong state leadership component. That may be because it's actually, you know, the chief executive has some direct role, people under the chief executive, um, but some of it's simply because they were conceived as statewide policy. But one of the advantages in some of those is, is simply being able to get that kind of 
uh, coordination because somebody's in charge, somebody has to own it, uh, and the commitment that means funding is more likely to come forward. Many of them have simpler processes to apply uh, than I think you have here currently with the programs in place. Most of them involve some kind of Main Street program, but they use them in, in different ways. Uh, most don't involve a lot of regulatory relief. Um, Maine is probably the closest to Vermont in that regard. Um, and I would say that not all of these are performing as originally intended, as I said, with uh, you know, Utah being one notable example. Um, long term, the commitment has to be there, or you know, this, this stuff doesn't, doesn't just go on automatic pilot. But to the extent that you can incorporate things that you know, gain, you know, take root and um, help to become kind of institutionalized and part of that culture, then you have a better chance of actually having this uh, sustain over time. And ultimately, that's what's necessary because by their nature, we're talking about something that takes time uh, to come to fruition. So we're now going to ask you to, um, to think a little bit about some of these issues uh, and ways in which some of these may be important to you. Uh, and um, we're going to do a little bit more of the polling exercise. And to do that, Rebecca and I are going to do a switcheroo. Yes. Do you want to take a question or two, Chris? Boy? Yes. So while she does that, I can take a question. Or half. See, nobody was ready. They weren't ready. They were all listening attentively. They didn't know they were supposed to be thinking of questions. Sorry? What about Oregon? What about Oregon? What about Oregon? Oregon is a, definitely an example of a state that has had a statewide commitment for a long time. Again, started on the agricultural side, which was with, and, and with the governor's initiative, basically Governor Tom McCall about four or five decades ago now, um, which was initially really focused on how do we save our farmland um, and uh, has had various iterations. Um, as with some of the other states, there's a, now a great literature debating whether it has or hasn't been effective. It's my own impression is a lot of it has worked quite well. Um, you do see farmland, you know, closer to developed areas, you know, not all turned in subdivision compared to many other places. Um, but again, you know, they have, they have their issues too. Um, we didn't talk about Oregon for a few reasons. One being that I think people are kind of tired of hearing about Oregon. Um, so we want to look at the places people would be less familiar with. Other question? Another question? All right, well, you ready to be asked a question? Okay. So I'm going to give a little reminder, Jance, in case you forgot what happened two hours ago. And for anybody who's new here, we're doing some live polling. There is a website up at the top here. And actually, you know what? I'm going to zoom back out for a second to that first slide so that had a QR code. That would make it easy for everybody again. OK, so if you want to participate in live polling on your phone, pull up this QR code or type in that website. Or if you like, you can do it by text. We're going to ask you a few poll questions. You can respond to some ideas that you heard in Chris's talk. Once you get that opened, I'm going to go back to the poll slides. And you will get a question popping up on your phone. And you'll have a chance to weigh in by multiple choice or by a couple different options for giving one. Does anybody need more time with this? Yes, a little more time? Okay. Remember, your village is here to help you. Ask for some help, wave a hand if you need some help. I'll give you another minute. How about another question, question for Chris while some folks are just getting this loaded up? Anyone have a question for Chris? <laughs> If you already have it loaded in your phone, Allison, then you're fine. If you're just joining or that browser tab disappeared from you for you, then you might need to get it. We've had a couple of people who needed a little more time. Yeah, question over here. Yeah. Are there international models that are worth considering, or are they just two, two different? You can restate it to yeah, the I, camera. I, sure. So the question is whether there are international models that are worth uh, looking 
looking at, or are they too different? So uh, there are definitely are international models, and there are some that I think work quite well. Um, I will say we're all hesitant to talk about them because that tends to have us wrong. There's always resistance to something not invented here, but if it comes from another country, you know, the people have the legitimate objection that we have different constitution, we have different laws, you know. Um, you know, frankly, there's not a bad model just north of here. Um, you know, I, I worked some years ago in Montreal where they created a regional plan that was aimed at focusing development around particularly transportation, you know, hubs of where there's public transportation, other transportation facilities around. They wanted to focus more of the development over a period of time. Um, and, but their, their plan isn't necessarily a lot different than you find in, you know, Des Moines or, you know, some other place here. The, the difference is that their regional body can tell the local, all the locals, your plan must be consistent with this. And you have to align them and you have so much time to do that. And that just doesn't happen, you know, in our states, right? Um, and, you know, we've, we've had that, that issue of having so much uh, power divided between localities, where I served in government, land use is our thing, um, and the state, on the other hand, having particularly mostly the funding authority, and getting something in between is really difficult. And we don't do a lot of that. In fact, you know, that's one of the one areas that Oregon is kind of odd because they actually have a regional government in the, in the Portland area in a way we really don't. Now, whether you can find mechanisms, like you have our, you know, our PCs here that can think it can fill some of that role is one of the things that I think is a, is a real question. Um, the difficulty is that the places that are most successful, if I look outside the United States, fundamentally involve a different level of power uh, in uh, regional bodies in particular, uh, or just from the national government. I mean, there are a lot of good examples in France, but it's very top down. And Vermont's not really a top down kind of place in a country that's not that much crazy about top down. So, you know, those things are interesting to look at, but they're a little bit harder to say, you know, can we, can we do that here? Okay, are we ready for some polls? Reminder, if you don't have a phone or it's not working for you, your neighbor can enter some votes for you. Just don't take advantage of it and put in 10 votes for yourself. So let me zoom back out to the right slide. Oh, we already had some of you voting, that's awesome. So the first question you're gonna hear is around the idea Chris shared of having gubernatorial participation to increase leadership, engagement, and likely of agency involvement. So in this case, you're doing a rating scale. If you are not interested in this idea, you're gonna click one or A. If you're really interested in this idea, you're gonna click five or E. And you can click somewhere in the middle if you fall somewhere in the middle. Just take about 10 seconds and answer that question on your poll if you would like to. Let's see 107. Okay, looks like we've got, got most of our votes in. And let's take a look at what we see. <coughs> there should be still, okay. So it looks like pretty significant interest in this idea. Last call for votes. All right. Second idea, how interested are you in streamlined application and administration to reduce barriers and burden of the designation programs. If you're not interested in streamlining the application and reducing burdens, give it a one. If you're pretty interested in that, give it a five. Let's see if there are any results that surprise us here. That's 78 votes in. If anyone's having trouble with voting, do not be afraid to ask for help. Let somebody down. Okay, let's take a look at what we're seeing. Wow, 
All right, I'm actually surprised that there's some people not as interested in the text. 64% very interested in reducing burdens. All right, any last votes? Get them in. Next up, ready to this reform idea, regional coordination and or municipalities working together to receive benefits. Oops, I'm giving you a preview. How interested are you in that one? Not interested one or A, very interested five, somewhere in between. All right, let's see what the votes say. Very interested, even more popular than streamlining administration, I think, just by the eyeball though. Okay, here's a new one. Before you do anything, let me explain this one to you because it's a little bit trickier. Um, this one, we're gonna ask you, oh, actually, I'm sorry. We had a duplicate, I take it back. Trick, see if you're paying attention. What would you like to see the designation programs do? This one, we're gonna ask you to rank in order from, of preference from top to bottom. Tap an answer and click the up or down arrow to move it. This one's a little bit trickier on your phone. So if you do tap one, you'll see an up or down arrow that will let you move it up or move it down if you would like it to be in a different order. If you like the order how it is, just click it and let it be. So let me read it for you at the top. It's locked. Now it's unlocked. Thank you. <laughs> now it's unlocked for you. Um, right now, at the top is impact a smaller number of communities more deeply. In the middle, maintain the current number of communities served. And at the bottom, impact a larger number of communities less intensely. So if you would rather see that larger number of communities impacted less intensely be the top priority for you, more important than drag it up to the top. Not again. Why is it doing that? Okay. We'll keep unlocking it if we need to. There we go. Yep, this one has that one. Okay, so about 10 more seconds here. And let's check out the responses on this one. Smaller number of communities more deeply. It's first. Lock again. Yep, I know. That one shut up. That was weird. Let's try the old fashioned way and see if we get the same results. How many of you would like to see top preference impact a smaller number of communities more deeply? Number one preference. How many of you would like to maintain the current number of communities served? And how many of you would like to impact a larger number of communities less intensely? Okay. So just by eyeballing that very scientific approach, it looks like our poll results are about in line with the hands. All right. Do you want to talk about these first? Yeah, just the last couple of things I'll mention. Um, so, you know, again, in thinking about what you want to do going forward and most immediately in the exercise we're about to have, um, just sort of food for thought. Um, one of the things I don't think I mentioned, uh, is I'm thinking about when we talk about uh, the needs of smaller communities in particular. One of the issues often is the smaller communities have a hard time even applying for aid. I, I'm not just under these programs, but under many programs. Uh, one of the things Utah did was to allow communities uh, to work together, basically to combine, so they can apply for something. Um, and that's you know that's one kind of idea that uh, you might want to think about. Um, more technical assistance, of course, to do it would would also help that, and that's the kind of thing you might you might want to be thinking about. Um, there is the question of the what the nature of state support should be. And I mentioned you know, technical assistance can more be done that way. There's obviously the question of funding. And I think we'll agree more funding would be better. Uh, but are there specific things we can talk about that you know would make sense as targets or as ways of funding? 
uh, or as just an emphasis even in advocacy for all of this. Um, we've talked about how you can, can we make these things easier to apply for, you know, can you, and there's a trade-off involved when you make it easier to apply. There's certain things we're not going to be controlling as much. Um, are there ways we can do that that makes sense? Uh, and what can we do to make uh, communities, you know, to better, get better alignment across communities? Again, we asked the question about RPCs, but some more to think about that. Anyway, these are all kind of different categories of areas in which there could conceivably be some kind of reform. And uh, I encourage you to be thinking about that as you move into this next exercise. It's what we're going to be thinking about after today as we collect all this information and go back to try to sift through it and create uh, some recommendations. More incentives that would make it more interesting and bigger, bigger rewards for being part of it. Where would those fit in those four little questions? I mean, because there's a lot more things that one might want to have in these programs that would make them more appealing or more. Right. And and please put them down. This is just don't worry about the questions the way I've thrown them up there. They're, is just food for thought. So you undoubtedly have a better idea. Please share it. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna turn you back over to Rebecca for the next bit of work. All right, thank you, Chris. So deep dive round two. Everybody's quiet after lunch. I hope you got coffee and cookies, and if you didn't, then once you're ready to go, you should go get coffee and cookies. Um, I promise this round is gonna be easier. You all worked really hard. That was complex stuff you did this morning. You did an amazing job. It all came together beautifully, and there's some fabulous stuff up on the walls. Um, and how about those headlights? Those were pretty amazing. So. You're on notice, those of you who are reporting headlines in the second round, you've got some big shoes to fill. Round two, we're going to take all of what you discussed and heard from Chris and came up with this morning and now basically solve it all. Come up with some answers this afternoon for how the designation programs should be totally resolved. We're back in 2023. You're here in Randall Center ready to get to work and come up with some fabulous ideas for the afternoon. So you are gonna break out a couple different ways here. When we asked you about your preferences in the poll, we asked you, are you more interested in reforming the existing programs or are you more interested in totally throwing them out the window and reimagining what they could be, what they could do? And very interestingly, almost exactly a third of you wanted to reform them, a third of you wanted to reimagine them, and a third of you had no preference at all. So those of you who wanted to reform will get to do that. Your task this afternoon is gonna be to take the existing programs, take what you've heard about what's not working, what is working, some of the ideas Chris shared, and think about what you really wanna improve and specifically around the topic ideas that are on your table this afternoon that say deep dive to. We also asked you what specific topic or aspect of these programs do you want to dig into? So you'll be at a table with one of these topics on the reform side. If you pick to reimagine, you can do whatever you want this afternoon. You just have to come up with something really, really amazing. <laughs> so we're gonna basically put you to work developing a totally new model and the sky is the limit. You can go crazy and come up with something incredible. We did make an effort to seat you at a table with people who are interested in the same themes as you are. We did not want somebody who has a brilliant idea for designation types to end up with somebody who has a brilliant idea for benefits and you both end up not getting to dive into the idea that you really want to dive into. So we're going to give that side of the room especially a lot of flexibility on what they do. Let me give you an overview of the plan here. It is definitely going to be a little more flexible and open-ended and simpler for you today. So you're both roughly going to be following the same path this afternoon, just with a couple of twists in what you're doing. If you are on the reform side, your table sign will say reform, and you're going to get a poster that looks like the one on the left. 
and you're going to have a couple of boxes at the top. Your first task is just going to be making some lists as a group of what you think is working well in your topic area and what you think might need to change. You've talked about that a lot today already. We've heard a lot about it and we're giving you some packets where we've captured a lot of the ideas that we have heard from people. So we're not asking you to reinvent the wheel, we're just asking you to capture a couple of the things that you feel like are most important for your group to focus in on today. You could do that by just going around and each writing one idea on a sticky note of something that you think is most important that is working, something you think is most important that's not. If you are then moving on, you're gonna start just generating some ideas and we're gonna ask you to think about both big ideas and quick ideas and then develop some actual recommendations for us. If you're on the reimagine side, we're gonna ask you to come up with a BHA DPI. Does anybody have any idea what that might be? <laughs> I like that one, but no. Sue's a little closer over here. You might have heard of BHAGs before, Big Hairy Audacious Goals. So you're coming up with Big Hairy Audacious Designation Program Ideas. It's not quite as cool of an acronym, but I think you're gonna come up with cool stuff. So your task, instead of what's working and what's not, is gonna be some challenges and opportunities you see. And then spend some time just tossing out some cool ideas and pretty quickly, Pick one and you will do what's called rapid prototyping. So in the time you have left, your job is to just come up with the best model for that thing that you can come up with and fill in those blank boxes with whatever details you can fill in about that model. You might focus on some of the aspects that the other side of the room is focusing on. You might say, this is what the benefits will be and here's how it's managed and here's what eligibility is. Or you might not do that. You might say, actually, we've got three ideas for boundary types, and that's how we're going to flesh out our boxes. Or you might say, actually, our table has three really big ideas. We're going to split up and do three different things. You kind of have free reign to do whatever you want to do if you're on the reimagined side. You just have to come up with something great. So we're going to put up pretty much parallel instructions, suggested ways to work through this. I would suggest in groups that you do those top, you know, what's working, what's not, opportunities, challenges, all together, just get them on the table. Don't take a lot of time with that. You don't have to come to agreement and consensus. It's just putting some stuff down to ground your conversation. On this side, that's what you're looking at. Um, that's that top section of the box. I would suggest maybe you think about breaking out into a small group for about 20 minutes and doing that exercise in a small group of what are some of the ideas that we want to generate here, just so you can have a smaller group conversation and come up with a few good ones to bring back. And then maybe spend 25 minutes or so as a whole group really working those and saying what are the biggest recommendations we really want to put forth or what is that big model. You can throw that out the window and stay together the whole time if you want. That's totally up to you. But I will give you these benchmark reminders again of where you are in time. Um, last, you will not be surprised. Again, final recommendations. Get them on your poster, finish up, and be ready to report out that big, bold headline. We suggest you assign some rules. Again, you still have your village, so please do make sure you have a note taker. Make sure that you have somebody who's keeping an eye on the clock, somebody who's keeping an eye on your overall goals. This is an especially great round to have that busybody wandering around the room and finding out what everybody else is doing and coming up to visit with us and getting some more resource documents and things like that. You will have a copy of what we've heard for your topic area. And what else? You will have a copy of some seed ideas, some big ideas we've heard already, and some small change ideas. You can steal these. You can work them a little further, or you can do your own thing. You will have a copy of overarching priorities that we've really heard across the board. And we have extra copies for other topics. So if you're at the benefits table and you want to hear about designation types, come get one in the back, and we'll give you what you like there. Okay? You will also have a copy of Chris's slides of approaches from other states. Those are fair game. If you heard an idea that you loved there and you want to develop that as a big recommendation, 
you can dig into that. We're not here to reinvent the wheel. We're just here to come up with the best solutions for Vermont. All right, so you're gonna get a poster dropped on your table. You're gonna have some big sticky notes and little sticky notes. You can go to town. If you feel like you're all by your lonesome at a table because things have shifted around or you wanna join a different group, go ahead and do that. <laughs> We're not gonna lock you into where you are. And you have about an hour and 10 minutes, okay? An hour and 15 to do this. We'll see you soon.